Where are we going to lunch? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first time we met out in California, wasn't it? Knott's Berry Farm. Yeah, 1980, 81, say somewhere in there. And Paul was on the road with Mel Tillis, and uh, I was making a record with one of the guys in, in Mel's band, a fiddle player named Jimmy Buchanan, and we went to see them play, and Paul and I hit it off, and the rest is history. We got our 40-year pen a couple of years ago, yeah. <laughs> being, being pals. Well, I remember I knew his history with the band, and then we got talking, and he happened to have a tape of new songs. And we went back to my, I had a boom box, so we went and played it, and uh, and I was blown away because I had, you know, it wasn't like Pure Prairie League. It was great original songs, and, and uh, I remember that, and we, we clicked. Well, I think, I think musicians are drawn to each other that are, that are like-minded. I think the important thing about being a musician is, is being um, a chameleon yeah. and being willing to try and do just about anything, you know. And you look at Paul's history of, of the amount of records he's played on is staggering, but the diversity of the records he's played on is pretty impressive. And I think that you'd say the same thing about me, you know. Work with Ralph Stanley and Gladys Knight, all you know, all in the all in this whole career. So, I think we're open-minded. We just love anything that's good, and and always doing our best to whatever situation we're in to make whatever it is we're doing a little bit better. I know when we clicked, one of the things we talked about was we talked about you know the music that we're into now, like but all the early country music, loving George Jones, loving all of that, and and. Uh, and I think that's what uh, musicians that click are have the same influences, maybe. And so there, when you start playing, you can have this conversation that if a musician doesn't have it, he could be brilliant, but he doesn't understand it. Then it's like it doesn't, you know, doesn't gel like it could. So. Yeah, musicians listen to each other. Yeah, the great ones do. And and maybe what he plays will influence what I sing and vice versa. And then me as a player too. These records we've made, we did Bakersfield 10 years ago, which was Merle Haggard and, and George Jones, um, I mean, uh, Buck Owens songs. And it was just as much about uh, the guitar player in me wanting to do this record with Paul. Like a lot of people would go, why are you doing a duet record with a musician? I said, because I am one, you know, and it makes a lot of sense for me. And and, and I love the instrument, you know, that that's first and foremost that I, it's my favorite instrument. To me, the steel guitar is really what put the real definitive sound to country music, you know, in a way that, that I think, like Earl Scruggs did to Bluegrass playing with Bill Monroe. Bill Monroe had these great songs and he sang great and killer band and all that, but it was the sound of that banjo that all of a sudden Bluegrass had its defining sound of what really identified it. And that's always been the case for me. And there've been periods in the history of country music where the steel was extremely popular and times where it was extremely not popular, you know, and, and Paul and I started making records together in the late 80s and and the steel guitar was not being featured like it used to be and that's how, you know, one of the ways our, our companionship got off to such a, a great start was he played on When I Call Your Name, he played that remarkable solo on that record that helped launch my career and so you know, the, the, that's what musicians do. They define, they define great records. You know, you can have a great song, but sometimes it's the musician that's going to put the, the right touch on it to, to make it memorable. Okay, I'm from a great country town of Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up. Uh, it was my dad's first uh, instrument that he would always point out when he'd hear "Slowly" by Webb Pierce, and he said, "Listen, to that steel guitar." And I was eight years old. And I ended up choosing, he asked me if I wanted to play, and I said, sure. And uh, I chose his instrument. He made me, I, I didn't really know. But uh, Vince pointed out, you know, like being influenced by something I might play. Well, in Detroit, there weren't, uh, there were a lot of good musicians, but I learned by playing on the radio. So I would, I noticed I was drawn to the Ray Price records because Buddy Emmons played on them, or George Jones, and as it turns out, Buddy Emmons and Jimmy Day played on those. I started realizing that there's a certain thing, but it's the emotion. I would listen to, you know, the way George Jones wouldn't just sing 
da 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 da. He goes do do. You know all these little bends and stuff, and, and he does the same thing. When I heard his tape, that was just I thought this guy. <laughs> Watch out. I just think the the mutual respect for each other mm -hmm. is what where it all comes from, you know. Yeah. I'm crazy about what he can do. And he may say the same thing about me, I hope so, you know, but. Uh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> But that's it, you know, we, we're like-minded. You know, we, we know what our, we know what our place is. We know what our job is. You know, the, the job is to, is to serve a song. You know, you've got this great song and if, if you're not, if you're not playing appropriately and what's necessary, you're gonna ruin it more often times than you're gonna make it better. And and that to me is what what great musicians do. They have a conversation. What you sing makes me play what I play, and what I play might make you sing what you sing, and him play what he plays. You know, I'm a I'm a, a recovering steel guitar player. <laughs> you know, when I was 18, I, I was so crazy about the instrument, I went and bought one. And it was the hardest thing I'd ever tried to learn how to do. I was actually Ricky Skaggs' first steel player in 1976 and I got fired because I wasn't any good, but I deserved it. <laughs> but um, I, l I just adored the sound of the instrument. You know, it felt closest to the human voice of any of the instruments that, that I'd learned to play. It had, this, had the ability to have the same kind of emotion. And, it, and, and so I've long been, been crazy about, the, you know, the instrument and all my records have been heavily influenced by steel guitar. Well, um, for me, I mean, you know, we just want to play it. You know, <laughs> one reason we just sit down and play, you know, and then use a the concept. We wanted to salute, well, Vince can tell you, but like Ray Price and George Jones and Jimmy Dickens, we talked about all of them and, and we just started with Ray Price and kept on getting more songs and Scott, this is great. And hopefully, um, you know, we had a ball doing it. And then, you know, it became a record. You know, it's fun because it, it speaks to the musician in both of us. You know, I'm singing these songs and it's fun to sing these songs and, and sometimes daunting. When you when you take on the classics and the greats, you know, there's there's obviously gonna be the immediate comparison, which is which is not the reason you've done it. Sadly. You know, you sit there and when you play for something, oh, it's all like the original better. Well, of course you do, I do too, but this is my way of doing it and it's not bad, but it's it's cool, you know, it's a little bit different. Yeah. And and so that's all you're trying to do is is I, I want to do these things with him because I I love the way he plays, you know, and I've I've worked on maybe a thousand artist records in my career, singing and playing, and I've sung with plenty of people. But this this really speaks to the musician in me more than anything else. And and so many of those old records they never got the opportunity, the musicians never got the opportunity to really show out. You take an old old record like that and and a musician would get to play the intro, you know, the singer would sing a little bit, they play a little turnaround, the singer would go back to singing. Records had to be under two minutes long and to get on the radio. And So this was a way that maybe musicians could, could stretch out a little bit. And what might happen had you given Buddy Emmons two solos in a row to play. He might have yeah. blown your freaking mind <laughs> if you'd given him the chance to. You never yeah. got the opportunity to. And so that's what it is. You know, there's a there's an old record that Conway Twitty did. It was so rare because that kind of thing never happened, but it's called Lost in the Feeling. And John Huey, who was a great steel guitar player, played with me on a lot of my records and on the road with me. And, and he got to play like two minutes on the fade, you know? Just, and it was the most haunting, beautiful thing you ever heard. And so I, I, I said, why wouldn't you go shoot for more of that? The, the, the instrument can be played as emotionally as a singer can sing. And it's, it's equally as compelling when it's done right. I, I liked the, the, I much preferred the Ray Price era of the earliest days. The, you know, when you think about the songwriters that are represented on this record, you've got uh, Hank Williams, Willie Nelson, Hank Cochran, you know, Tillis, Bobby Bear, and, and uh, just all these great songwriters. Um, one of the songs we did was called Weary Blues, which was a Hank Williams song. And I'd never heard Ray sing it, you know? And I stumbled into a lot of these songs that I never knew Ray had done versions of. And so we didn't want to do the obvious. We didn't want to do the biggest hits of his career and just 
tackle that. And I've played this record for a lot of great students of, of Ray Price and, and the music and stumped them on several things that I had no idea he ever recorded that. And I've, I found that out to be true myself. And so we, we picked songs that, once again, would showcase the musicianship every bit as much as, you know, we try to obviously pick the best songs, our favorite songs that we liked, you know, but also give, give each of us a, a chance to shine as musicians as well. Uh, for me, uh, you know, we all have that sentiment when we go back to our hometowns and you know, this music for me went back to, the, I started playing when I was eight. So it went back to what I learned to play by listening to the radio. Well, the songs I heard on the radio were Ray Price, George Jones, Merle Haggard, Buck Owens. So this, you know, I'm sitting in, in modern times and nothing, no offense against all, all of the new music, which I love, but, uh, you know, it's the chance to go back into that candy store. It's like, oh, I want to sample this, and I remember this, and bring it, all the various elements that I learned. And uh, and then, all, of course, I've got my modern day influences, and he'll play something on guitar. We, we do this, not only the singing thing, but we play, you know, just messing around before we even cut the song. We'll do, we'll do stuff, and, and things happen, and, you know, it's a call and response. A lot of it is, really, between all the musicians. I hear a lot of people when, when they hear this record say, man, I've never really, I never get to hear Paul play like this. I say, it's because he's not given the chance to. You know, the well is deep, the, the well of knowledge uh, of the history of the instrument. And, and, and that's, what, that's what I love, you know, the freedom to, to explore and play. He'll play something I said, and I'll drive him nuts, you know, straight up. You're driving nuts. Well, but, <laughs> <laughs> you make me better but, than well, I Well, but I mean, he'll play something and I go, that was cool, but if, what if you took that low note and it went down and do you have a pedal that could make that, do, you know, and he just throw his hands up and go, I'll try, you know, and, and so with that, you know, creativity, you know, if, if everybody's willing mm -hmm. to not worry about where a great idea comes from, yeah. there is no end to what, yeah. what is possible you know and that, that's that's a beautiful thing about musicians like Paul is they don't they don't let their their ego get in the way it's I important. think it's players I'm sorry yeah. <laughs> but one thing that we do that we we agree on is neither one of us want to replicate no like like we play we create within the emotion of a Don Rich or a Buddy Emmons or a Pete Wade or whoever but we want to bring our own voice to that and that's a yeah. That's I don't. A thing. There's nothing. There's nothing more uninteresting to me than a note-for-note note adaptation of somebody else's record. Yeah. You know, then then all you're doing is copying note-for-note note what somebody else has already done. Find your own way to, to play that song. Find your own way to sing that song. I'm singing these songs, and and you got to understand, Ray Price was was a one-of-a-kind phraser of the way he sang songs, and it's not it's not like I do. So I have to be a, a wise enough student to borrow elements of it, but to not ape it from, from note for note and, and all that. So it's, it's, it's a great exercise in, in me getting to learn. You know, go, wow, listen to how long he waited before he started that, those, those three or four words or what have you. And, and so as long as you can kind of lean into the spirit of something without it being exactly like something, then it's, to me, it has a chance of being way more interesting. Oh God, <laughs> the next one. You play one, you go, that's the best. <laughs> because our hearts are connected to every song. Okay, first of all, but but there's one that jumps out at when, because of uh, we lost Don Sears and Sweet Memories when Vince sings that and and uh, his uh, you know interpretation of that. That's still, that's one I just kind of pause, and wait to play the next song because it's, it brings yeah. back so many memories. Yeah, you know, and, and and the beauty of that is, I had no idea Ray, Ray Price ever cut Sweet Memories. Really? Mm -mm. I never knew it. I, you know, I, I know it's a great Mickey Newberry song and heard everybody sing it and I was always drawn to Dawn singing it. She, she killed it. You know, every night we'd play and she'd sing it. And I thought, oh man, we get to not only honor Ray, but we get to remember Dawn. Yeah. You know, and, and once again, it's, it's nothing like she sang it. And it's not really anything like Ray sang it. Maybe it's probably closer to how Ray sang it than it is to Don.
but she had her own spin and her own way that was remarkable. And so that's that's got a that's got a real personal attachment to it. You know, we did a, a version of Danny Boy on this record, and and what I was trying to accomplish is there's a great old Willie Nelson song called Nightlife that everybody covers. Steel players play it, you know, all the time. It's it's a showpiece for for steel players. They can play the blues and you know the, you know. And I thought, man, if we could do Danny Boy in that spirit and kind of make it fall in line with something like that. And, and it turned out beautifully, you know, and, and I sang a few notes on there that it, it just was, it was really fun for me. You know, it's like some of my favorite notes I've ever sung, just hitting a certain note and the way it, it did what it did. And I was apprehensive about doing Danny Boy because it's, it can be one of those songs like, oh God, all we need is one more high singer to sing that damn song, <laughs> you know? And, and, and so there's an element of risk you know, when you're when you're doing something somebody else has done, you know, then then you then you run the risk of of them using that comparison of of of, of the original, like I said earlier. But um, that was great. I think the song, the record starts off with a song called "One More Time," which is it's a little Ray Price, but it's also a little bit Bakersfield, and it feels a little more like in the spirit of where Bakersfield left off. And we start off with that and go, hey, we're going. It kind of reminds us a little bit of Bakersfield, but it's kind of also heading in this in this new way. Um, God, what else on that record do I love? You wouldn't know, love yeah. is one of my favorites. That's a that's a great. It's a, it's a really beautiful orchestration of musicians playing together. The way that song unfolded, what John Jarvis did on the piano, what mm -hmm. he played, but every every element of that was just like. Oh, yes, yes. You know, nothing ever, nothing ever took you out of that trance, or that spirit, or that dance, or whatever was going on. Uh, and it's just fun. Like I said, it's 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 a blast for me to sing these songs. But I, I get just as much joy hearing him play in ways that you just don't get to hear anymore. You know, that's that's a big part of it. We never said it, but I, I miss it. I miss hearing that kind of music. It's not a knock on on what the kids today are doing. I don't have a problem with any of it. I want them to be as creative and love what they love as deep as they do. And, and they're not gonna get a grumpy old man comment out yeah. of me, you know? <laughs> they don't do it the way we did it. You yeah. know, we, just, we did this because we're nuts about it. It's that simple. And you know, what's cool about it is, is guys our age and older are gonna, they're gonna be drawn to it because they miss it too. And they love this kind of music, but it also has an amazing opportunity to show Show a young kid who's 20 years old, oh wow, this is pretty cool the way this went. What's this all about, you know? It's not familiar to me. And they go back and, and you get to show them about, a little bit about history, it's fun. Well, just, just what Vince uh, alluded to is that it bridges, you know, I mean, I hope they love what we do. And, but, but if it uh, inspires someone, a singer or somebody going, I never heard yeah, you know, there are a lot of people that may not have heard Danny Boy, and they hear his phrasing on Danny Boy. If that draws somebody in, the guy, I'm going to take a closer look and go uh, back a decade earlier than they what they thought was cool. And I, I did the same thing. I moved to Nashville in '72, and I it was all you could do to get me to listen to stuff in the '60s. I had already done it as a kid, but I wanted to move forward. I was all into where's this town going. So if this, this helps somebody to just look a little farther back, because there, there's great music from the 40s, all the, all the decades. And, and so if we can do that, then I think that'd be a wonderful gift. It would also be equally as, uh, as powerful if it, if it moved it forward. Yeah. You know, nobody thinks about that. They only think, oh, well, you're, it's all retro. It's all like, the, you know, I said, well, but no, this could be, this could be a way that people choose to move forward. You know, if enough people love it, you know, then maybe they'd be more more drawn to, to cut a shuffle mm -hmm. and have some fiddles and steel guitars on stuff, you know. And there's nothing there's never been anything wrong with it. Country music his country music's history is has often run from its its definition sometimes mm -hmm. in that they were I don't the embarrassed is the wrong word, but 
just not proud of what they were. They wanted to be more pop. They wanted to be more this. They wanted to uh, be more in line with what was going on. You know, you go back to the 50s and rock and roll almost killed this music. You know, it did a tremendous amount of damage to country music, just in its, its popularity. People say to me all the time, they say country music is dead. I go, no, it isn't. It's just not popular. Yeah. You know, this kind of, yeah. this element, these, these things that, that, that make this, you know. And once again, you put on this record and I don't think you listen to it and say, oh, this feels like 1958. I think you listen to it, it, it kind of harkens. It's, it's, it's kind of influenced by it, by it but it, mm -hmm. it sounds as, as fresh and, and, and as original. Mm -hmm. It's now, you know, like I said, anybody can ape a record note for note. That's not hard to do. But if you make something original that has history in, in the process, I think that's a pretty good combination.